You have to be careful when you tell God that you'll do anything that he asks you to do because I told him, no matter what day you put me on, no matter what time, I will do it. Well, he chose the worst day and he chose the worst time. You see, I actually go to bed at this time. I'm usually asleep by now and me being awake and being able to talk to you at this point is all God, not me. So just know that what you hear tonight will not be my words. But I want to start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just be with each one of us tonight. Help us to reflect back in our own lives and see how you've been working. I know that sometimes we tend to cloud it out, but Lord, you are always connected with us. And help us to remember that this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. I have another confession to make. I've actually, over break, I didn't spend hardly any time with God whatsoever. And when I got the email from Pastor Adam, I started crying <laughs> because I'm not worthy to speak in front of you. I'm no better than the people that decided not to come to any wise meetings this entire week because I failed God. His connection is always there. Like, it's never gone. But I've put a plug on it so many times. And I realized at that point that that was God saying, Bailey, don't forget about me. And realizing that the connection is never gone has encouraged me so many times in my life. God has encouraged me through so many trials and through so many amazing people. And I remember one time in particular, my, well, many times, my dad and I would walk to school together. And I was, you know, grade one, whatever, and he was holding my hand, and we would walk to school, and I would look up at my dad and be like, Daddy, turbo! And so he'd hold my hand even tighter, and he'd run as fast as he could to school. And my legs being so short, um, I was flying like a kite behind him. And this was so amazing, because this was the time that I cherished most with my dad. I looked forward to going to school every day, not for the school part, but for walking with my dad. And one day I was going to school by myself. And I remember looking back and I saw my parents talking in the driveway and I was like, this is strange, but I'll go with my brothers, it doesn't matter. So I walked back with my brothers and when I came back from school that night, or evening I guess, my parents were still in the driveway. They were in a different position because they weren't there all day. But when I got there, I could feel tension in the air. And my mom came down to my level and she looked at me in the eyes and said, Honey, your dad and I are getting a divorce. I was about seven years old. And again, she looked at me and she said, You need to choose who you're going to live with. <laughs> a seven-year-old girl looking at both her parents. And I chose my mom. My brothers had chosen my mom. And so I chose to live with my mom. And I could... I looked at my dad and he started crying because all his children had chosen his wife over him. And, you know, as the year went by, I started questioning God so much. Why is this God that I've grown up knowing taking away our family connection that we had? How is that a just and merciful God? I found out when I became older that the reason my parents got a divorce was actually because my mom gave my dad one of two options. You can choose your family who you love, or you can choose your God. You know the outcome, obviously. My parents got a divorce, so my dad chose God over his family. And a year later, I remember we went to the park together, my dad and I, and my dad was sitting on the bench. He wasn't really looking at me as much. Well, he was watching me intently, but I could tell his mind was somewhere else. And he called me over and he knelt down in front of me and said, Honey, you know that I love you so much. And he started crying and hugged me. And he said, No matter what, no matter how far away I am, just know that your Heavenly Father is always with you. The next morning, I got in the car and I left my city. I said goodbye to my friends. I left my province, I said goodbye to my family, I left my country, I said goodbye to all those memories that I had at home. And I went to America, and for those Americans in here, the American flag represents liberty, freedom, happiness. But for me, 
It represented separation, anxiety. I had to live a whole new life now. Well, living in America, I didn't want to get hurt again. I didn't want my family to hurt me anymore. I didn't want my friends to hurt me anymore. And so I decided to push everyone away. And by pushing everyone away, I wanted acceptance still. I craved acceptance because I didn't want to get hurt again. And so I stopped eating in a sense. My day consisted of an apple for breakfast, maybe some carrots for lunch, and maybe a can of tomato soup for supper. And that's how I fit in. That's how I got my acceptance, because I was skinny like the popular girls. I needed to get good grades for my mom, so I studied literally day and night to get all A's in my classes, no matter how hard it was and how much I had to give up for that. I did everything I could to keep that connection with people. And when our family left my dad, he went to church and he knelt on the ground and he just wept. He's like, God, I chose you over my family and now you're taking my family to a different country. How is this fair? How is this in your plan? I don't understand how you're working this out. And we've all had times like that, maybe not to that extent, but where we question, why is God doing this? And why right now? This is the worst time. There's never a good time to lose your family, though. But anyway, I grew up a little older, and then I picked up the flute. And I was the worst flute player you could ever hear. I sounded like a dying duck. And my mom must have realized this because she said, Bailey, I think you should go to a different school and learn to play. <laughs> and so my little brother and I went to this academy that had a master class where anyone could come and just play and learn their instrument better. And so I decided, hey, I don't want to go. <laughs> and my mom made me, and she's not a Christian. And so this was very strange how that happened. But anyway, my brother and I went. We came back. Two years later was another master class. And this time, I really wanted to go, but my mom wouldn't let me. But confession time again, the reason I wanted to go was actually because I had met a guy there that I liked. And so, <laughs> and so I didn't want to go for the spiritual side. I didn't want to go to learn my instrument. I just wanted to see this guy that I really liked. And so um, God saw the motive in my heart, and he still opened up a way for me to go. And for some reason, my mom said she was busy, whatever, and that she would, you know, send us off anyway. And so we went to this academy, and the last day there, I remember the pastor, and he was giving a message on how we can't store up our treasures on this earth because what are they going to do for you when you get to heaven? Where are you gonna, what are you going to do with them? You're going to die, and the government is going to take most of it. And then you're going to give whatever, you're going to give whatever you have left to maybe a sibling, maybe your parents if they're still alive. But that hit me really hard. And I looked around at all these students and I'm like, they have something that I'm missing. Why are they happy with this God who's hurt me so much? Why are they happy? And so I searched for it myself. And literally it was like a click moment like that where I was like, I need God in my life. Little did I know that these people that I was looking up to were actually secretly judging me in most cases. They all, when I became a student, I figured this out. They all um, told me, once I had grown up a little bit, that they all viewed me as the flirt that came to Fountain View. And I was just the person that went and talked to all the guys. And so that was my reputation, but I didn't know that. And so it didn't bother me. So I want to encourage you that be careful what you think of people. They could be looking up to you. But regardless, after that click moment, I decided I needed to do something to find this God that they had because the God I knew was a dictator and someone that ruined lives. So I asked God, Lord, how do I find you? How do I get closer to you? Where is this connection that everyone claims is there? And he asked me to do something for him. And he told me, Bailey, your music is getting in the way of your relationship with me. And so I know for everyone this isn't the case, but for me particularly, I was letting music get in the way of my time with God. And I would come home from school and I would turn on the radio instead of reading my Bible. 
And my dad would call me every night and he'd be like, honey, how, what did you read today? And I'd lie. I'd open up my Bible, find something, be like, I read this. He's like, oh, what did it mean to you? He'd be like, and I'd say, uh, God is good. Pretty much every time. And so it was just, I didn't have it. And so God's like, Bailey, I need you to do this for me. And so I negotiated with God a little bit. I was like, eh, I'm not going to get rid of it all the way. I'll just, you know, I'll put the bad stuff that he wanted me to get rid of, I'll put that stuff in a, like, a separate playlist so that when my friends look at my iPod, I still have it. So I'm still accepted. But I'm, I'll change it for you, God, just no one else will know. Anyway, eventually I was able to totally surrender that. But as I started surrendering these things, my mom got livid with me. She started swearing at me any time she could. And please don't get me wrong, I love my mom with all my heart. She is an amazing woman. She's created me into the person I am today. But I've had some hard times with her. She's judged me for who I am, and she's pretty well told me that I'm ugly without makeup on. But anyway, that's beside the point. I've had a lot of hard times with my mom. And it got even worse one night when I asked God, okay, God, I need to grow with you more. I'm stuck. I'm in, like, this rut, and I can't get out. So he said, okay, Bailey, I want you to pray now in school. I was going to a public school with 2,500 people, and God was asking me to pray in the middle of that cafeteria for my food and bless it and thank him for it. I was like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. And he immediately popped the verse, Matthew 10, 33, into my head. If you deny me in front of your friends, I will deny you in front of my father. And that hit me so hard. And so I promised him, I was like, I'm not going to eat lunch until I can pray for, with, you know, bless my food. And so I went to school and I just stared at my food the entire time. I didn't eat. <laughs> I was so scared that my friends would judge me. And so the next day I came and I had lunch and I was even more hungry at this point. <laughs> and so I just stared and stared. And then I did kind of like a ninja move. I was like, thank you for the food, amen. And <laughs> all, my, all my friends immediately did a quick look and was like, you pray? And that hurt me because I was supposed to be this Christian that people can look up to, but I was hiding it. Anyway, I kind of did this like, yeah, not in front of you, but now I am. And so it got easier. And then, my, then God asked me to pray in front of my mom. And every time I did, she'd give me a dirty look and be like, you don't need to do that. Why are you doing that? Your religion is doing that to you. Things escalated and my mom started a court case. And it was with my dad and I was part of it as well. And it was all because of me. She started the court case saying that my religion was a cult and it was brainwashing me. And how you're, you're a young girl and your mother is telling you that you're a part of a cult and the only reason you're doing things is because they've brainwashed you. And it was really hard for me to swallow that my mom would do that and say those things about me. Well, eventually as time drew on, these court cases, by the way, these court cases officially ended this year, my mom finally signed that she would drop them all. And she even admitted that she was doing it to get payback to my dad. So praise the Lord for that. I'm really excited. But um, as I grew up, I decided that that place where I first realized I needed to give my life to God, I wanted to go to school there. And I'm not going to tell you how I knew this, because it would take a lot of explanation, but I knew that God was sending me, and if you hadn't figured out the master class thing, that's Fountain View Academy, by the way. But God specifically told me that I was going to go to Fountain View. And I told him, Lord, if you're not going to send me there, do not tell me that I'm going because I don't want to get hurt again. I'm tired of it. And he said, Bailey, I promise that you'll go. And so I booked a flight without my mom's permission and I packed secret bags and I had the date I was going. And then Fountain View calls and they're like, hey, how's it going? I said, oh, not too bad. She, they're like, oh, well, by the way, since your mom's your legal guardian, you need her physical signature to allow you to go. And 
I hung up the phone. I remember I was in the Zares grocery store. If you don't know where that is, it's mainly in Ontario. But I was at the grocery store in the produce aisle, and I literally, my dad was there, and I looked at him. I was like, Dad, God is the worst. Like, he just broke his promise to me. It says in the Bible that he doesn't break his promises, but he broke it to me. How can I trust this God that told me I was going to go somewhere? And then he goes around and flips it on me. And not only that, but it's going to make my mom hate me even more. Well, obviously I had to ask my mom. And so I asked her and she said, in your dreams, you're not going. There's no way. Well, 4 a.m., the day my flight was going to go, I got up and had a shower. I was at my mom's house because she was my legal guardian. And so I got up, and as soon as I was dressed and everything, my mom opened my door. She's like, get back into bed. What do you think you're doing? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to school. The one you said I couldn't go to? That's the one I'm going to. <laughs> and she freaked out. She said, you let me know when your father gets here. So my dad pulled in the driveway, and thankfully we had this thing where he would come regardless of what happened, because my mom ended up taking my phone away, so I couldn't tell him what was going on. But my dad gets here, my mom runs outside, and she starts yelling at him. I try to walk outside, I open the door, my mom grabs me by the arm and throws me in the house, and I hit the wall, and by this time my brothers are awake. And remember, it's like 4.30 in the morning. My brothers are looking out their windows, like, I mean, not their windows, their doors, and they're thinking, what's going on? <laughs> Is someone, like, dying? <laughs> and when I got thrown in the house, my mom grabbed the phone, and she started dialing 911. And she called the police, and the police came to the house as well. And here I was sitting there, I was like, God, you are literally the worst God in the entire world. How can I trust a God like you, who now, not only did I need the signature, but now the police are involved? What's going to happen now? I got to the point where I just wanted to give up. I was just like, you know what? Don't bring the police. I'll just go back to my room, fall asleep, pretend like nothing happened. Well, it was too late because the police showed up. And they came to talk to my parents, talk to me. And then they looked at me in the eyes and they said, Bailey, you're 16 years old and you can choose what family member you want to live with as your legal guardian. And they said, you can go to Fountain View if you want to. And I don't know if you guys know the police system very well, but the fact that they said I could go is incredible. They didn't side with the mom this time. The government usually does that. But... They didn't side with the mom this time, and I was just like, what an amazing God I serve. Even when I doubted him the most, he worked everything out and flipped it all around so that it was actually an answer to my prayer. God often does that. He does tricky things. He's like, you think this is the worst? I can make it worse. But when you get to the end, you're going to realize how amazing it actually was. And... The only reason that I kept pushing when everything got so hard, when my friends started not wanting to be around me because of my changes I was making, when my mom was getting so upset at me, the reason I kept going was because God gave me a reason to keep going. Keep going. He would give me this in forms of Bible verses and random emails from people that I hadn't talked to in years. They would just email me and say, hey, I hope you're doing okay. I'm praying for you. And I knew that this was God talking to me. You know, like I said, I'm a failure. I fail God every day, and I wish I didn't, because I realize that every time I hurt him, it's like putting those nails back into his wrists. But because of God, because of what he's done in my life, I'm a changed person. I've learned to forgive. And I don't know how incredible you realize this is, but... I've learned to forgive my mom. And at first, I couldn't. I would talk to my teachers at school. I was like, I can't forgive her. It's impossible. Do you realize what she does to me? She calls me at school and gets mad at me when I don't call her and then gets mad at me when I call her too much. Like, how can I balance this out? Why? What's going on? But I've learned to forgive. I have this joy and peace that I honestly can't understand. When Jeff and Josh were talking today, I was probably more nervous than everyone else because I knew I was going to talk next. 
And I was sitting there and literally I could feel my heart pounding. And I was like, oh my goodness, I think I might have a heart attack. And at lunch I couldn't eat because nothing was even remotely edible to me. And that's not because, <laughs> that's not because of the calf. It's <laughs> anyway, you understand what I'm trying to say. But <laughs> it's really amazing because when I was sitting there waiting for my turn to come up on stage, my heart was normal. I wasn't nervous at all. Chris Murphy was more nervous than I was. <laughs> so I realized that I don't have to worry about anything. My entire life, your entire lives are in his hands. He desires a connection with you. And I don't have the formula for the perfect connection. I really don't. I don't know because obviously on break, I was failing miserably with connecting with God. I don't know how this works. But I do know the times where I felt closest to God is when I actually talked to him like a person. I'm sure some of you have had these times where you're walking outside and you literally talk audibly to God. Those are the times where I just feel like his presence is all around me. Or for some of us, it's when we sing. It's just us and God. That's it. For me, I had to find out what was harming my connection with God. And oftentimes I realized it was my pride, the fact that I wanted all the time and not any, devote any to Him. But my relationship with God is often weak. And the reason I believe it's weak is because we are so happy with a cup that's a quarter full because we filled it. Meanwhile, God is waiting to make our cups overflowing. It's because of my stubbornness that I don't give God my cup. I'm like, no, God, I can do it myself. I know what's best for my life. And all throughout my life, I thought that. But then looking back now, I can see through all those times of trial, they were actually blessings in disguise. I want to sing a song. And you guys probably all know it or know part of it. You're welcome to sing along if you would like. But I really want you to take this time to listen to the words, reflect back on your life, and reflect on the times where you felt God was the furthest away. And then think again and see how close he actually was. Probably why it wasn't working before. Your voice to hear 
We cry out in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea. Yet long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not our home. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater this world can't satisfy What if trials of this life The rain, the storms, the hardest nights Are your mercies in disguise? You know, I didn't understand why God would allow all these things to happen to me. In the time, I didn't see that these sleepless nights, these storms in my life were actually blessings from God. He's always desiring that connection with us. And you know, I was gonna show you an illustration, but I actually forgot about it. I'm gonna show you now. When we connect with God, we often feel, let me just make sure that my jacket will get on properly. When we look at our lives, we often wanna be in control. And I don't know how this is gonna work because now I have to hold the microphone. Let me just put it here and I'll talk like this. <laughs> so, in our lives, we want our own control. So we often don't put God first. I'm gonna put my friends first this time. And then, what about my time? My time is really important to me. And then, my family comes in here somewhere. Maybe I'll put them down here. <laughs> this is how I viewed it. And God, he's supposed to be number one. He's now not anymore. And do you see how confused your life can get? When you don't put God first, nothing else falls in place. But I realized that as I learned to put God first, and I learned to give up my own control, I don't want the things that I want anymore. I don't want the things that seem to be the treasures of the earth that I won't be able to keep later on. When you put God first, everything else falls into place. And now, I want to encourage you tonight to actually think and reflect on the life that God has blessed you with and the blessings he's given you. He's waiting for you to desire to connect with him. And He's just waiting for us to give up our own agenda, to put him first. And the only question he's asking is, will you let me fill your cup to overflowing?